All right. Well, I guess that's a uh, um, reason to begin. So let's see. I think my camera is on and facing the right way. If not, let me know. Um, but uh, welcome. And, um, you know, let's begin with introductions. Um, Stoyan, do you mind taking a roll? I'm on it. Uh, Andrew is I'm here. here. Uh, Charles. Sue. Sue Kaufman. Uh, Mark. Uh, okay. Uh, mm. Sh Sean. Damon. I'm here. Okay. Uh, Cory. Here. Cory is here. Uh, Todd. Here. I can see him. Here. Okay. Todd and I have the same virtual backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Uh, Rob, Robert Graper. Chris. I'm here. Okay. Al Spalding. Here. Michael Barr. I'm here. Okay. And uh, Will Rodriguez. Okay, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have seven members attending. We have a quorum. Wonderful. All right. Any members of the public wish to introduce yourselves? Good morning, everyone. Terry Beal here again, representing Sound Transit. Good morning. Morning, Terry. Thank you. Hey, good morning. My name is Devin Makash. I'm an assistant deputy state fire marshal from the fire marshal's office. Thank you, Devin. All righty. Um, let's move on to the review and approval of the agenda. Um, anyone have any comments on the agenda as presented? So if not, if anyone wants to take a motion, you this can is Al. This is Al. I move to, to approve the agenda. Thank you, Al. Mr. Chris, I'll second. Thanks, Chris. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. All those opposed? So motion passes. Uh, next up is approval of the minutes from last week, which are up on the screen now. So I'll give everyone a moment to take a look through those. Um, nice and short. I move to approve the minutes from last meeting. Thank you, Damon. Do you have a second? This is Al. I'll second. Thank you, Al. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? And the motion passes. So next up, we've got our uh, um, existing state amendments, which we'll finish going through. Um, so we've got those up right now. And Stoyan, I guess I'll hand things over to you to begin. Does that work? Uh, I will be very sh quick on this one. Uh, I was uh, uh, wanted to show you the format. So this is the first page and uh, there, is a, uh, there is a summary. So we have uh, existing state amendments that are recommended by the tag for repeal. So we have 116 of those. Uh, we have uh, some uh, existing amendments that we will keep, but they just need some modification. We have 41 of those and keep existing amendments as is uh, 164. Uh, some of these existing amendments may, uh, may need some renumbering, but nothing uh, to the language. And what I wanted to show you uh, 
there is uh, text in green in some chapters. So what I did, uh, some of these uh, recommendations, the TAC recommendations, they were uh, with questions or uh, further review or uh, a check uh, code references. So I, I did all that and uh, you will see the green as uh, a staff recommendation. So it's not really for the TAC to vote on it, it's just a staff recommendation based on uh, our TAC member, uh, members' comments. Uh, so this will be available for the standing committee uh, tomorrow uh, if uh, uh, you know the standing committee gets to discuss uh, these particular sections. So this is how I wanted to show you. I have uh, some uh, comments for chapters uh, four, uh, uh, seven, and uh, 10. So I, I sent you in advance this uh, uh, spreadsheet. And of course, if, if uh, uh, there are comments that you don't like, or uh, you have uh, concerns, uh, I can, uh, you know, delete the comments and uh, not have them for the standing committee. This is all I have for the existing amendments. Okay. Um, anyone have any comments, questions? No, it, it looks, really clear, which is great. Um, I would say, I guess, what do we need? What do you need from us? So, so at the end of today, we need to give you a package you can give to the, the standing committees, the council, right? I will, I will use whatever you see on the screen right now. This is the, uh, uh, the final draft that will be used for the standing committee tomorrow. So again, the, the green comments are for uh, your information because they are somehow related to your recommendations, you know, some of the recommendations. Uh, the TAC doesn't need to do, uh, uh, doesn't need to vote on it. I just wanted to give you a heads up that there are additional no, uh, uh, comments in addition, in addition to your recommendations. All right, well, thank you. So, um, Stoyan, should we take a vote? No. Oh, I... just, uh, okay. Okay, so now we are going to uh, the bigger deal. These are uh, the significant changes. Uh, all chapters are now in one uh, document, uh, in one file. So I will start from chapter one. And uh, chapter one was discussed. And you will see at the bottom of chapter one uh, in, uh, with the uh, uh, yellow highlight, it's been approved. Our recommendations have been approved. Chapter two, chapter two was discussed uh, at the meeting last week and uh, it needs to be approved or modified, whatever you wish. So those are kept open. This is Al. Those are kept open and we didn't vote on that. So members had a chance to review that in advance of this meeting, correct? Yes. Well, unless there's any discussion, I'm, I'm ready to make a motion. Yeah, please do. Awkward pause, just in case someone wants to... <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll ask if there's discussion too after you make the motion, but but yeah, I guess now would be the time if anyone from the public has anything to say, because once we make a motion, um, there's no discussion from the public. All right, we'll go ahead, Al. Uh, 
I'd like to make a motion that we accept the recommendations as presented to us. I'll second it, Ms. Chris. Thank you. Um, any further discussion? I think we all said what we needed to say, so on this. All right, that was an attempt at a joke, so. Okay, all those in favor, please <laughs> say aye. 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 All those opposed and motion passes. Uh, for chapter three, uh, Al is uh, here and he worked on uh, uh, chapter three and four. So I'll ask Al. Uh, you, you ready for me to present chapter three? Yes, please. Okay, so this is significant changes and I don't know about the rest of you, but I started really focusing on all the changes and not those that were significant. So we're probably going to see some things that aren't super significant, but I'm pointing out things. Um, the first one I wanted to point out is uh, section 303.1.5. Um, there is no number for from the 20, uh, 2018. This is regarding special amusement areas. It, just really, this is not significant, folks. It just provides a pointer to section 411. So I actually want to change my mind. I don't think there are fiscal impacts to this. That Instead of a yes, that would be a no. Um, there are potentially fiscal impacts for section 411, but that's not what I'm currently reporting on. And I don't think we need an amendment. Any questions? Okay, moving on. Section 304.2, uh, again, there was no um, corresponding number in uh, 2018. Uh, this is regards to air traffic control towers. This is not significant. I was just pointing out, as I got started, I was just pointing out everything new. What we're seeing a lot of, and I think others have reported this already, is that the 2021 does a much better job of, of providing pointers to the applicable sections as it would relate to, for instance, air traffic control towers. And so I don't find any fiscal impact with that. And I don't recommend that we make a amendment in relation to that as well. Any questions? Next section. Uh, what, what code section was that? Sorry. That's 304.2. Oh, okay, sorry. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, again, 304.3, <laughs> I was just getting started off, so it's really not significant, but there's what I'm trying to share with you here is that uh, that is a new section. There's no corresponding number in the 2018. This is about ambulatory care facilities. It provides a pointer to section 422. I don't find any fiscal impact, and I also don't recommend an amendment at this time. Any questions? Not hearing any. Uh, Again, 304.4, uh, there was no corresponding 2018 code section. This is higher education laboratories. Yes. It really just provides a pointer to section 428. That's correct. I don't find any fiscal impact and I'll make a recommendation for, I, I say no amendment as well. So I didn't really find anything significant with chapter three, uh, frankly, um, a lot of new pointers. Uh, and then I, I found quite, quite a few more than that, but I realized, oh, these aren't really significant. These are just for ease of use. Uh, so, and for clarity. Um, oh, that's not all three. We have a couple more. Um, I'm sorry. Next section, still in chapter three, 305.3. Uh, again, no corresponding 2018 code section number. This is storm shelters and group E occupancies. Um, storm shelters required for group E occupancies. It, it identifies where they're required by section 423.5. So in fact, this is just really a pointer. So it doesn't actually have fiscal impact, but there potentially is fiscal impact in 423.5. So I would change my mind to no for fiscal impact in retrospect. And I also don't recommend uh, an amendment is needed. Any questions? Yep, perfect note. Next section, 310.4.2. Uh, same section as uh, in 2018. This is regarding uh, 
owner occupied lodging houses. I should have probably put that. That's okay. Uh, and there is a restriction on the uh, number of guests they can have. I think it's up to five and the total occupant, uh, total occupants, uh, no more than 10. And, uh, but this uh, allows construction in accordance with the IRC provided an automatic sprinkler system is installed in accordance with uh, the IBC or the IRC. And uh, this potentially does have impact, uh, although in fact, this is a pointer again. Uh, well, no, it's not really a pointer. This, this potentially does have impact. And I had a question mark uh, regarding the requirement for an amendment because it's my recollection that typically we don't, we haven't as a state adopted the International Residential Code provisions for fire sprinklers. And what I'm concerned about, and this does say or, it says you have to do one or the other. Um, my concern is, is that uh, somebody makes an application to, to construct one of these, or they have an existing one, uh, existing facility that they wanna bring online as a lodging house. And they make application, they say, well, we're just gonna follow the IRC or we were previously approved under the IRC. And so we don't, we don't think we need a sprinkler system because the state of Washington hasn't adopted the sprinkler provisions in the IRC. Now, I feel confident that I could say this says or, so you still gotta have it in accordance with the IBC. But I'm curious how others feel because I know that I'm not the only one that ends up in sometimes contentious conversations <laughs> about how this works. Do you think people need, an, do we need an amendment to clarify that you would, you, you, you're gonna have to have a sprinkler system regardless if you go under the IRC or the IBC? Thoughts? Hi, this is Bruce. Uh, um, I do have a thought on this uh, based upon experience. I know in California, they had align the language in P2904 and, and this section so that they were the same verbiage and made that as an amendment. Is that something that's possible in Washington? Good question. If, uh, if I can say something, um, well, in California, it's like in Washington. Uh, California doesn't adopt the International Plumbing Code. Uh, California adopts uh, Uniform Plumbing Code. And uh, this section uh, uh, a few years ago was kept there by mistake, P2904. So we, we, we have something like mistake in Washington too, because uh, we don't adopt chapter 29, P29, uh, 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 in, uh, in the residential code, we don't adopt this chapter, but we refer to P2904. So there will be an amendment, I assume, in the residential code. And uh, uh, regarding this requirement here, uh, based on experience, again, uh, it, it provides an option, uh, but it doesn't make doesn't exempt the uh, sprinkler system. So if uh, the international residential code is used, then the sprinkler system will be required. This is just a personal opinion. I absolutely agree. I was the only reason I would suggest um, an amendment at all, and it may not be needed, is I'm just trying to, for all the local jurisdictions, authorities having jurisdiction in the state of Washington to make it very clear and have a consistent, uh, have it consistent to all the architects, designers, uh, people that are reading this, that you, it is an option, but you have to do one or the other. And in this it, case, it sounds like the other, you know, uh, you're gonna have to use the IBC. Yeah. The coordination between IBC and IRC will be needed because again, if in IRC, we decide to change how the references to the uh, fire sprinklers requirements are uh, used, then it will uh, trigger uh, modifications in the building code too. 
Alex. So the question mark, the question mark here, I think, outlines perfectly the situation. Chris, Al, yeah, um, I would say, I think similar to how you know, if you're doing something that's kind of outside the scope of the IRC, you end up in the IBC, like most commonly for structural elements. Um, if you think somebody could connect dots so that all P2904 is, is a, is a direct copy of NFPA 13, which is, or sorry, 13D, which is the standard that is referenced by 903.313. So oh, okay. Okay. It, all it, it's, it's just a way to not have to buy NFPA 13D. I think is the the reason why it's there, right? Because it's already included in the bill in the residential code. So P twenty nine oh four is just an FPA standard that's been inserted into the book. Um, if we think that there is a, a possibility that anybody could connect dots, you could just delete the or P twenty nine oh four and you're still gonna you're not gonna require anything more of somebody. You're still gonna band up back at NFPA thirteen D. So if you think there's a problem, I think it's fine to delete the P2904. You know, this, I'm not willing to say it's a problem. I just wanted to get other people's opinions in terms of their experience on something like this. Uh, I don't run into this a lot. We don't deal with lodging houses here at the Department of Health too much. So um, I just wanted to throw it out there that uh, if anyone had a different opinion that, you know, I think it's clear enough, uh, just, just as you just as you mentioned there, Chris. So I'm okay without it. I, I would say no, but I just wanted to have a bit of a conversation to make sure people were comfortable. This, this is Corey. I mean, usually don't you always enforce the most, if there's conflicts in the code, don't you always enforce the most restrictive anyway? Yes, we do. So I think that ends the argument right there. Well, then I would suggest that we change my recommendation to no for an amendment needed. I, um, I don't know. I think we should, I mean, it wouldn't have an amendment leave more flexibility into how that's interpreted. I mean, I'm, I think an amendment's fine that we could, um, I don't know, just provide more clarification through an amendment. Well, I'm, I'm on the fence and that's the other reason I put the question mark there because, you know, from an administrative standpoint, if we can, if we can stick as close to the model code as possible, and we don't need an amendment, then I'd rather not have one. And that's why I asked. I mean, if it was that Damon who said that. Yeah, it was. Is there a reason why you would want an amendment? I'm thinking that would just be more clarity for like home builders and just knowing that there is an option there. And it's clearly stated. Well, I think I right? said there's um, really no option. You're you're going to either do a 13D and the IBC, or you're going to do a 13D in the IRC. That's what Chris is pointing out, which is a good point. And I'm not super familiar with that per se, which is my own my own fault, I guess. Um, is there any way we could leave this open, or do we have to have a res has it resolved today? I'd like to do a bit more um, look into this section. Well, I think they have a report due tomorrow, don't they, Stoyant? Don't you have a report? This report's due tomorrow? Yes, it uh, uh, will be discussed at the standing committee meeting tomorrow. And uh, I want to clarify uh, regarding the amendment. Uh, technically, based on the, the technical requirements, we don't Amendment is not needed, but uh, for clarification purposes, the amendment may be needed again if in the residential court, uh, the decision is not to adopt section P2904. And uh, this is just uh, for, for clarity, nothing uh, regulatory behind it. And, and it's, I would it's, also- it's, 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 it's just a clean up to avoid uh, uh, misleading, that's all. And I would also just suggest, Damon, that uh, we're not even in the open amendment period yet. So in terms of keeping this open, I would say that we 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 vote on these recommendations today. It doesn't preclude any individual from submitting an amendment when we get to that stage of the process. Yeah, 
Would um, since there is a fiscal impact included with this, um, how would would an amendment help kind of clarify what that uh, fiscal impact would be too? Mm, or is there, I mean, no. is there any way to really state what what a, what the fiscal impact would be? Oh uh, well, it's fiscal impacts related to the requirements the for cost. This is already related to in there, isn't it? This is not a new thing. Three, it allows for a cheaper system too, so it's it's <laughs> the the it's the least expensive system available. Yeah. Oh, but no. amendments typically don't qualify the 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 uh, the fiscal costs associated. This yeah. this is my part. Right, but there's a there's a cost from this. I mean, because we you determined there was a cost from this change. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to scroll down. I just down. want to make sure. I just want to make sure everything gets. You know, it's, it's as clear as possible moving forward when it's implemented in code, which I think mm -hmm. it will be. I think we're getting to that. That's what I'm picking up on. So I'm. I, let me get to. The, I think that's all new language, Chris. In oh, 310. I think it's new language in the building code, but I don't think it's new language in the IRC. And what happens with um, correlating with the IRC, oh, right? So we, so well, these two, we're, are oh, we going to have to, I, I think Chris mentioned that. Yeah, sorry. Go yeah. ahead. Oh, no, I was, what I was going to think, I think I can connect all the dots here. Um, I believe this section is pulled from the IRC to correlate better with the IRC. If you go to the IRC today, it tells you what to do with owner-occupied lodging homes. Um, and that's already folded into the Washington State Amendments for scope. If you go to the chapter one of IRC and look at scope, and it says if you've got an owner-occupied lodging home with two or fewer guest rooms, you don't have to provide sprinklers, but at three or more, you do. Um, so I don't know that there is a do you remember, Al, when you're looking at it, if it had a, a number of rooms threshold? Uh, well, just in general, uh, the owner-occupied lodging houses are restricted to five or fewer guests and 10 or fewer total occupants. Um, that uh, doesn't talk about the number of rooms per se. Okay. Um, but I, uh, I think what you're pointing out, Chris, is this is really likely not a significant change. It's something I'm not, I don't use the IRC a lot either. And I forgot yeah. to cross-reference the IRC. And I think what you're saying is this really isn't significant, but this is clarifying language. And as such, um, it probably doesn't have any costs associated with it. And it probably still doesn't need an amendment. Um, yes, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think we need an amendment because there are thresholds that we already have in Washington State Amendments in the IRC. Um, and it oh, distinguishes okay. between lodging homes with two or fewer guest rooms or three or more. So we need to align this definition with existing IRC amendments um, and I can give you the section number if you give me 10 seconds maybe 15 <laughs> thank you Chris <clears throat> does this elect but isn't there still fiscal cost associated with this due to I mean because this, this is new language right they're requiring this construction to have no. automatic sprinkler systems installed because it's already okay. required by the IRC. This is just making it clear to people that live in the building code book that um, this is what you're supposed to do and to kick it out of the building code and go back to the IRC. Okay, so it's R101.2 scope. There's existing Washington State Amendment there. Um, yeah, and I agree with, with Chris and, and this really does, it just needs to correlate with IRC or the consistency of, of what's already there. And, and even as far as, as the 20, chapter 29 is not adopted, it doesn't need to be because the way we adopt uh, Appendix U in the IRC then just, you know, just references it, but it references it essentially as a standard. 
just like it references NMPA 13D for the same circumstance. So to get there to the requirement is, is fairly clear uh, from a code path. Yep, and we referenced uh, 2904 in our state amendment in the IRC right. and Appendix U. So I think as long as we just copy over whatever's in the IRC, we'll be fine. What was the section that you referenced? It's 101.2 um, scope. Do you need to add that to the notes? Oh, it may have frozen. <laughs> there it goes. Okay. Okay. So from that perspective, I guess my recommendation would be costs, new costs or no. Amendment needed, yes, in terms of the correlation. Any further discussion? If there's um, a change, like, I'm just trying to get this straight in the head. So with there being an option to do 903.3.1.3 or P2904, would there be, I mean, there's going to be a cost depending on which way, which path you take, right? Yeah, it, there would be if this was a new requirement. But it's not a new it's requirement. A new requirement. It's new for the building code, right? But not it, it, for it, it, it allows you to in the building code now it specifies if you want to use the building code, you have to install the same type of sprinkler system as you would have to if you're using the IRC. Okay. So yeah, I'm, that, this is, but that, I'm just I just think there's a, if it's a new section, there'd be and a cost, right? I mean, I know, I know it's from the IRC, but I guess I don't understand. Um, it gives like you the building it gives code you, and, and the fire code are different, you know, codes. And a new section for building code would be a new section. They're not. I mean, unless they're they're not like a shared deal, right? I just I'm I'm kind of confused on that. I'm sorry. It gives you a cheaper option. It gives you a less expensive option. Yeah, Stoyan's right. Because if you if you lived in the building code and all you every day all that's all you do is building code, and you had an owner occupied lodging home come in, and you did not class it, you just would classify it probably as a group R one, as a apartment or hotel, right? You would say put an NFPA thirteen R sprinkler system in the nine hundred three point one point three point two. That is a more robust system than the 13D option, which the IRC allows. So what this section is saying, if you have an owner-occupied lodging home, get out of this book, go back and use the IRC is okay, which will save you money. Um, so I guess you there would be a fiscal that. impact, but it would be a positive. It would be less. Yes. And yeah, they only I'd... care about negatives, I think. <laughs> and, and, uh, is there any and, way to note, note yeah. that portion at least? or I think that's significant. I just think that's important to know and to mention maybe. A one in two fan or one in two room lodging house is, is less expensive yet because in the IBC that would require sprinkling just simply because it's an R. <laughs> When you take that and go to the IRC, and if you only have one or two guest rooms, you don't have to sprinkle at all. So it, it you know, what this does is it is actually a, a significant reduction in cost in some of those uh, small circumstances. Okay. Yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking of like you know keeping things pretty clear for um, for my folks and just keeping it as you know transparent i guess there's clarity and i'm i'm uh kind of new to this still so i get confused when trying to keep all this stuff together but well it's been doing it for 35 years and we still get confused with all this stuff <laughs> that's what i've been hearing so. <laughs> Okay, well, does that capture the notes capture your concerns, Damon? 
I think so. Yes. I would. I mean, but there's no way to um, kind of like to have some time to look into this a little more. This is going to be the kind of cut and dried. Well, Damon, remember, uh, you know, we've got our meeting tomorrow. You can always make comments and then we'll have the council meeting as well. So this is just yeah. an initial recommendation. So, um, you know, you've still got two more bites at the apple. Okay. All right. Thanks, Andrew. I, yeah, going to keep that in mind. Thank you. All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions on that, thanks for the conversation and thoughts. Appreciate it. Uh, I, there were other changes in chapter three, but none that I felt were significant. A lot of new pointers, but uh, I stopped pointing those out. Um, anyways, uh, that's what I have for chapter three. Andrew, and because this is the last meeting before the uh, meeting tomorrow, uh, the TAC needs to vote on these chapters? Right. Yep. So any, uh, any discussion prior to making a motion? There is, real quick, the way uh, Krista has that typed could be a reduction in cost if built under IBC rather than IRC. Seems like those should be switched. It's a reduction of cost if built under the IRC as opposed to the, or, you know, rather than the IBC. No, what I meant to say is if it's built under the IBC but using the IRC sprinkler provisions. Okay. I, I can't really see now why, if you're allowed to build it under the IRC, why somebody would choose to go with the IBC, but. Yeah, I agree. I think it's just Agreed. this section was added just to say, hey, get out of this book. <laughs> yeah, agreed. All right, any other comments? If not, uh, if anyone wants to make a motion. Al, that's Chris, probably best oh, if you want to. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. It's Chris. I'll move to recommend um, Al's recommendations. Thank you. In second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? And the motion passes. Okay, I think I'm still up for chapter four here. So uh, first significant change, uh, hopefully, I, I tried a little better this in this chapter not to identify the pointers because I realized they weren't real significant. So the, the first significant change I identified was uh, 406.6.4 through 406.6.4.4. There is no corresponding 2018 number. These are new requirements for mechanical, mechanically accessed enclosed parking garages. Uh, there, so these are all new requirements that uh, I see for 2021 uh, compared to 2018. So I do feel that there are fiscal impacts, but I don't feel that there's an amendment needed. Any questions? Okay, moving on. I'm, I'm kind of curious, does anyone have any of these in your jurisdictions? They're starting, I, I'm starting to see some of them being built, but uh, I don't do much review of those. Yeah, I've seen a couple. Or we're talking like the memory care with the kitchen, right? More or less. Uh, no, I'm talking about mechanically oh. accessed and closed parking garages. Oh, sorry. I think I think I have a colleague in Olympia who lives in an apartment and they built one. Yeah. Yep. We have one yeah. in Olympia. Yep. That's the first one that I've seen in a long time. Okay. I'm moving on. Uh, next section is 407.2.7. .7. There is no corresponding number in the 2018. So this is new. Uh, this is regarding cooking appliances used in domestic cooking facilities. Highlight is intentional. And group I2 
uh, occupancy types. And this really adds new uh, adds six new conditions that that uh, are applicable if you decide to do this. Um, this does have a fiscal impact. I too, primarily in this state, is going to be hospitals, nursing homes, uh, and a few others. Um, and I have a question mark on a, an amendment because one of the things that's interesting to me is. And I'm glad that there's a representation from the state fire marshal's office here today in today's meeting. Um, there's really no definition of domestic cooking facilities. I can make some assumptions based on our practice at the Department of Health, and you know we would we would probably consider like in a in an I2 hospital or nursing home. It's very common for them to have a space, a room dedicated for you know, like activity where you can go in and potentially meet with a group of people or have, have family members over. They could potentially bring uh, some food to warm up in an oven. And uh, that, that would uh, trigger these six new requirements. Um, That's probably the best example I can provide. In nursing homes, it's very uncommon for uh, nursing home resident units where you're, you're, you're gonna be assigned and stay in the night and receiving most of your care, it's very, as well as a hospital. It's very uncommon for you to have domestic or cooking appliances um, in, in those spaces, but it's more common for like an activity room or a reception room or something of that nature. Um, so the only reason I have a question mark about this is I'm wanting to make sure that we apply this across the straight across the state uniformly and con and consistently and without a oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Without a definition for domestic cooking facilities, I'm not sure uh, if 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 we will achieve that. Any thoughts on that? I guess there are no additional thoughts. Okay. Um. Sorry, could you repeat that? I kind of, there's a loud noise. Couldn't really. Yeah, Damon, what I was saying is the only reason that I have a question mark about whether or not we need a state amendment is there's no definition of a domestic. Uh, oh gosh, I have to go back to the uh, domestic cooking facilities used in domestic cooking facilities. Typically in an I-2, most of the cooking facilities that you're gonna run into are commercial settings that are regulated under not only the Washington State Adopted Food Code, but would, you know, all the, like the type one hood, the mechanical code, all, all the goodies are gonna be applied uh, traditionally to the commercial. But this uses a different term that we don't have a ton of experience with in Washington, domestic cooking facilities, and it's not defined. As such, there's the potential for a range of enforcement or application, which isn't always desirable. We kind of like to be consistent and be clear on what it is. What is a domestic cooking facility and when would we, so that we know when to apply this. And so I'm suggesting there's a poss there, there is the potential for a need for just a, an amendment to define what a domestic cooking facility is. And I would, you know, I was trying to outline for you folks what I believe a domestic cooking facility is uh, versus a commercial cooking establishment or, or facility. Or Corey, is, is, there a, is there a definition in the mechanical code for domestic cooking appliances? I don't think so, Corey. I don't have, I don't have one right here. There's a lot of information about domestic or residential cooking equipment used in commercial uh, situation, you know, in a commercial area. But uh, we really, this is kind of a new term and it's a little bit of a term of art 
So that's that's why I'm asking if you folks think we need a, a amendment. And frankly, regardless of the answer, I'm going to take this back to my group and we, the Department of Health uh, Construction Review Services may end up filing, uh, um, submitting a proposal for a, uh, an amendment re re just to make sure. I have not taken this back to my group yet, so. I, I, this, this is Sue. I actually, um, I think that so, uh, whoever said that about the mechanical code, I think they define which ones are like commercial versus domestic cooking. I think that might be true that it might be defined in the mechanical code, not necessarily as a definition, but maybe it's described what cooking appliances. They do. You're right, Sue. They talk about cooking appliances. They don't yeah. talk about what a domestic cooking facility is. Oh, facility. Oh, oh, okay. Huh. The IMC defines commercial cooking appliance with kind of, if it's not commercial, assumed to be domestic. Domestic. Cooking. But that again oh. is appliances, not the facility. Correct. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I understand what your issue is now. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a good point domestic cooking facilities, huh, okay. <laughs> I think this is gonna be a little bit more important when I get a little bit further down in my report when we get to I-1, because we're gonna, in, an, in, I, in group I-1 occupancy types, we're gonna, we have a ton of, potentially we have a ton of domestic cooking facilities. Um, yeah, this is perfect. That's that's we can leave it as a question mark, and um, that's a perfect note. Thank you. Well, um, if if it's Krista that made that note, thank you. Should we keep moving on? I don't hear a lot of concern or question about that. Yeah, I'd say unless people ask questions, you may as well just keep moving. And if you are. Uh, um, is that in your background or is someone not muting themselves? It's like his own person. Someone signed I see in. I can't hear, but I don't have any idea what that person is because it's a okay. spooky. <laughs> All right. Well, if, uh, if you're not supposed to be talking, if you don't mind muting, um, you know, please do. And when I say supposed to, if uh, you, know, you can mute. Okay. All right. Continue. Okay, Andrew. Thank you. Next section is 407.6.1. The 2018 corresponding is 407.6. Uh, these are new requirements for automatic closing doors, uh, hold open devices. Uh, again, this is specific to I2s, uh, so nursing homes, hospitals. And the automatic release on one hold open device shall release all such doors within the same smoke compartment. So that is a new requirement that is going to have a fiscal impact. Um, and it kind of depends on how big your smoke compartments are and how many doors that you have on hold open devices, but, um, it will cost additional money. I think that the requirement makes sense. I don't think we need a, um, an amendment. Any questions? Okay. I'll keep moving on then. Uh, next significant change I found was section 420.9. Uh, it's the same uh, reference section in 2018. This is group I-1 occupancy, so that would be both condition one and two. Um, cooking appliances, is, it's the same, pardon me, it's the same language. Cooking appliances installed in domestic cooking facilities. There, there are actually five new requirements instead of six, because one was previously um, in the already there. Um, this will have significant cost to assisted living facilities, which often provide um, licensed assisted living facilities in this state are, are really like uh, apartment buildings um, that uh, are licensed to provide healthcare services, although it be very 
uh, low acuity. Um, and it's very common for these apartments to be equipped with a kitchenette, with a stovetop oven. Uh, and so this will significantly impact those people. Um, you know, uh, I get the reason it's in the model code. I think that probably uh, the, the folks in attendance with a better knowledge of the fire history associated with these types of uh, facilities would, would tell you that, uh, yeah, uh, there's a, a high occurrence of, of fire smoke events that happen in these domestic cooking facilities, which again, we haven't defined. <laughs> so, um, so this would, I, I'm assuming this would include those activity spaces that are common areas to people that can be used. You know, families come in and have a little reception, birthday party, something like that, maybe heat up some, something that was pre-cooked or would it potentially apply to uh, a residence uh, unit uh, or private like apartment, I'll say. Uh, and it would require additional mitigations. So this will definitely have costs. Uh, the only reason I'm concerned about the amendment needed is again, there's no definition for domestic cooking facilities. And I think if we're going to apply this uniformly across the state, that, that's probably a good idea. So maybe almost the same note we had up above. Any questions about that? Same, okay, I'm gonna move on. Same for section 422.7, no corresponding uh, section number in 2018. This is a new requirement for ambulatory care facilities, which I find interesting because I, I do have a lot of history with ambulatory care facilities and I don't find that typically they have cooking appliances, but I guess they could. Um, and- uh, Well, remember they're still, um... I guess the uh, um, break lounges and whatnot, even though yeah. that, since it's not defined, who knows, you know. There, there are actually some exceptions to this, uh, to these new requirements. Um, uh, I won't go into that, but, uh, um, but it will cost money. That's why I'm pointing it out as significant. And I don't think we need an amendment unless we change that to a question mark because again, the term is undefined. Um, so that's all of the significant changes that I found in chapter four. And if there aren't any questions or comments on that, I'd be happy to make a motion to accept my own recommendations. All right, I don't hear any other comments. So if anyone wants to second. I second. second. Oh. All right, thank you. Um, we'll give another minute if anyone has any discussion. Well, not a minute, a couple seconds. And I don't hear any. So all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? And the motion passes. So, Stoyan, did you do chapter five? I did chapter five. Oh, okay, Damon. Um, you're ready to go? Uh, yeah, I think so. Sorry, my screen just got really big. Um, yeah, I, I believe no I'm ready to go. Perfect. Okay, um, so first we have 503.1.4, occupied roof allowances. Um, this was a clarification um, that occupied roofs have been clarified for more consistent application of the code's intent. So I think they're pretty much just stating like the top story can be an occupied roof if the they're just clarifying how that how that all works there um so i didn't i don't think there are any costs associated with that and i don't believe there's an amendment needed um allowable height and feet um this was a new addition um 
height limits and feet above grade plane have now been established, addressing mass timber types of construction um, for 4A, 4B, and 4C. <clears throat> um, and these are tables. I believe they're just changes to those tables, or these are they're new tables. Um, allowable height and stories, uh, height limits and stories above grade plane have been established for mass timber construction increases in allowable height for S1 occupancies. Bill, uh, table 506.2, allowable building areas was an addition. Um, building area limitations established for the three new mass timber construction types increase in single story floor area for group I3 occupancies of type 2A construction. Uh, 506.3.2, allowable area frontage increase. They modified this um, to simplify the methodology or um, the allowable area increase for frontage through the use of a tab tab tabular format. Um, so they modified it to a table. Um, 508.4.4, separated occupancies, clarified this as uh, a format change to table 508.4, um, addressing separated occupancies intended to eliminate confusion regarding the table's proper use. Um, so. Uh, with all of these, I don't think there's a cost or an amendment needed. Um, fire separation of mass timbers, um, in addition, using mass timber as a fire separation, including the thermal barriers. Um, I mean, I guess there could be a, I mean, it's just an addition, so I don't. Yeah, if it's an addition, a new cost. option, I wouldn't say that adds any cost. Yeah, there's no cost or amendment there um clarify the live work unit uh change from special use provisions of chapter four to mixed occupancy provisions of section 508 um, no change to technical requirements um storage battery systems as incidental uses so the modification um stationary storage battery systems uh, corresponding fire separations acquired for uses have been deleted from table 509.1 and are now regulated by section 1207 of the IFC. So it's uh, kind of changes it to the IFC, to the IBC. And then 510.2, stairway construction and podium buildings. Um, so the modification that stairways may be constructed out of combustible material depending on the location, um, if the building is combustible or non-combustible. So they're kind of just clarified or they, modified that to kind of I think say you can have a combustible stairway if it's you know within like a floor below the with you know with the mixed combustible if it's a combustible building or not my understanding uh, on that one was that they allowed full combustible even below the podium slab now um yeah I think that... it, it was I think that's correct okay I, yeah because previously I mean that makes sense um you know it's all a, a same stairway so to have to use steel construction up until the podium slab and then after that to have wood that never really made sense so okay yeah. that's okay so yeah maybe worth just uh mentioning um combustible construction allowed an entire stairway um we'll write that okay sorry damon go ahead no i think that's accurate um, that's all I have. Okay, perfect. I do have one question as far as um, occupied roofs go. Um, was that changed to clarify that an occupied roof is not a story still, or are they changing that into a story? And Chris, you may be able to correct me if I'm wrong. That would deal from uh, what I can think of. The only thing it would deal with would be um, whether or not it would affect the high rise. Um, designation mm. um with what um, are you thinking yes slash no um <laughs> the high-rise definition isn't tied to story it's tied to occupied level so um right so if it's not an occupied I, okay i yep. you know I, i'll look through that later i guess too okay you know, no no we still I, have I, more bites it, to uh, the apple. it um the amendments the new stuff makes it clear that you treat it like it was on the story below so if you could have done the thing that you're trying to do on the occupied roof on the story below it's okay 
That's okay, so it's not adding an additional story. Um, it is not. Perfect. Okay. It's like I'll a like mezzanine that. for the purposes of code analysis. Perfect. Okay. Any uh, and Damon, you were finished with chapter five, correct? So. Um, yes. Okay. So, was there any discussion? And if not, I'll entertain a motion. Damon, if you want to make it, since it's, it's your chapter. Uh, yeah, I move to approve um, section five and to recommend this to the TAG for the BFP subcommittee. That's probably the wrong. Perfect, is there a second? Huh. Is Chris, I'll second. <clears throat> okay, any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? And motion passes. I can talk about chapter six. Uh, okay, thank you. I think I overkilled it a little bit because I have all model code amendments, including the editorial amendments. So I apologize for that. Uh, the first one is table 601. And uh, this is an existing table, the fire resistance rating requirements for building elements, but uh, it adds uh, new uh, construction types uh, for A, uh, uh, B, and, and C. So I separated uh, uh, the amendments in table 601 and Three and I will try to explain why. And I, I provided detailed information uh, for you guys to uh, evaluate uh, if you if you need more information. So the first one, I have uh, no cost and no amendments needed because uh, this change is the same as the existing uh, uh, Washington amendment. So I have no for both. And uh, there is a, a footnote footnote C, and this footnote uh, has been modified, allowing all components of the roof construction, which includes the uh, structural frame members uh, to consist of uh, heavy timber. And uh, in my personal opinion, um, there is no cost associated with it and we don't need an amendment, but uh, I don't have much of experience with that. So uh, I try to review uh, the ICC documents and uh, uh, for the adoption process, but um, it was a little bit confusing when, when I was going through these documents. So if there are different opinions, uh, I'll be glad to uh, get involved in the discussion. And uh, there is a new footnote, a G, and uh, uh, this is applicable only to type for uh, heavy timber construction. So what this footnote, does it requires heavy timber interior bearing walls supporting more than two floors for a floor and a roof to be fire resistance rated for at least one hour so with this application uh, which is uh, 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 typically for vertical elements and mid-rise buildings uh, this new mandate uh, may result in increase in wall thickness in exposed heavy timber interior bearing walls supporting multiple stories in order to provide the minimum one hour rating. So I, I uh, merged uh, here uh, an existing opinion, uh, uh, personal opinion with uh, the comment that I found uh, 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 from the ICC meetings. And I think uh, uh, the cost uh, will be uh, significant here. But again, uh, I see Todd may have more uh, uh, experience and, and better information than me on this one. Hey, Stoyan, I'll just add that I agree 100% with what you've written here. Um, the note I would make that we don't have to necessarily include for this round is that there's a little bit of uncertainty, I'll say, in, in, in chapter uh, six regarding uh, the new construction types on, on whether the HT prescriptive provisions for thickness 
um, they're, they're, they're not well written. They're, they, they bounce around a little bit and I, th I think there's a little bit of clarification. So just a heads up that I'm gonna, there are a few of us in the state and, and with the uh, American Wood Council are, are thinking about proposing an amendment uh, in the, in, as a major, up, um, major amendment coming in up in June. So just a heads up. But I, what you've written it, I, believe, I agree with 100%. So should we change the uh, amend, amendment needed to yes, or keep it no for now and uh, wait for uh, potential new proposals? As I'm trying to gain consensus that this is appropriate, um, I think we just leave it no for now and then just be heads up that there might be a proposal coming in. Okay. But but now we're now we're not regarding C and C uh, footnotes C and G. I think I think you're accurate on those. Okay, thank you. So I'm moving to 602.4, and uh, I wanted to save some space. Uh, I didn't want to have uh, uh, 50 pages table, so I will include our subsections here: uh, 602.4.1 through 602.4.4.3, and uh, this is again. Um, related to type four construction. And uh, uh, what I have here is uh, the past allowances for type four buildings uh, 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 have been maintained as type four heavy timber construction. And now again, it's added to the table, three new construction types for A, B and C. Uh, and uh, this recognizes other forms of mass timber construction. So, uh, there are some changes in section, section 602.4 and uh, all subsections, but I don't see any uh, cost associated with it. And I, I don't think there will be a need for a uh, Washington amendment. Any comments on that? I agree. Uh, I'm moving to 603.1, and uh, this is the uh, this is related to allowable materials in types one and two construction. So, uh, in buildings of type one and two construction, the allowance for use of fire retardant treated wood in shaft enclosures and roof construction uh, is um, uh, modified, uh, and it's specific to group uh, I two buildings. So in addition, the use of wood nailers for parapet flashing and roof, uh, uh, I can't, uh, in, I'm sorry, is permitted in our building. So when, uh, again, when I was comparing uh, uh, the new model code language and, and the comments during the adoption, the ICC adoption process, I didn't see any uh, cost associated with this uh, new amendment. And I don't think it, uh, there is a need for amendment. Uh, any comment on this section? So this is all I have for uh, chapter uh, for chapter six. All right. Any uh, any questions or discussion? You did a good job, Stoyan. Um, if not, can we get a motion? I move to recommend the recommendations provided by staff. This is Thank Al. You, second. Thanks, Al. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? And motion passes. Thank you. So, Stodian, back to you for seven. Uh, so chapter seven, and I, I, uh, I have to be honest with you, uh, uh, fire and smoke protection features are not my uh, favorite uh, topic to discuss. And it a little bit, well, not a little bit exceeds my, my knowledge, but I did a lot of research again using the ICC uh, documents that were uh, uh, discussed during the adoption process. So I, I will expect uh, um, the Firefox that 
are much more knowledgeable than, than me uh, to weigh in and uh, you know add additional uh, comments. So, uh, for section seven hundred three point two, this is the related to the fire resistance, and uh, it seems like the section was reorganized and uh, the testing procedures were relocated uh, to a different section seven hundred three point two point one. I didn't find any uh, regulatory changes, and I I I have n for uh, the cost and uh, amendments. The next one is uh, a seven hundred three point two point three, and uh, this is a new section. Uh, it's related to uh, it provides another option uh, approved alternate method for fire resistance uh, what it does is uh, allows the fire resistance of building elements components or assemblies to be established by an alternative protection method in accordance with section 104.11 and uh, i know damon will say oh it's a new section yeah it is but uh, it it doesn't seem to have cost impact because uh, it provides another option so uh, uh, alternative provision and uh, it refers to section 104.11 and uh, the alternative approval is already allowed in the building code so i didn't find any uh, uh, cost impact on it the next one is 703.3.1 Currently, it used to be 703.5.1 uh, non-combustible materials. Uh, so uh, this section, uh, which I will include the exception here, is uh, a reformatted version of sections 703.51, which was elementary, uh, elementary materials, and 703.5.2 composite materials. Uh, and it appears this way currently in 2018 IBC. Uh, so what is the modification here? New alternative testing method is added, allowing materials required to be non-combustible to be tested in accordance with uh, ASTM E2652. Uh, so I didn't find any cost impact on it because it seems to be a, a, a new alternative method, another option. Uh, but again, um, I I expect there are more knowledgeable folks than me. So if you have uh, better information or comments for this section. Okay, I'm moving then. 703.6. Currently, it used to be 703.8. Uh, determination of non-combustible protection time contribution. This is the title of the section. So this is a new section. Uh, hmm. Oh, OK, sorry. So it was a state amendment currently in section 703.8. And this is a new section in 2021 and it aligns with the existing state amendment. So we are repealing the existing state amendment and uh, uh, we're adopting the model code section. I, I got confused with the section numbers. But. So there is no cost associated with it. We will already have it in the code, in 2018 uh, building code. The same with the next section, 703.7. Currently, we have a state amendment in section 703.9. Uh, and the new section replaces the existing state amendment. We will uh, adopt the model code and we'll repeal the uh, current state amendment. The next section, 704.4, protection of secondary structural members. What it does, it adds structural to the title and the text. Uh, and um, I was, thinking a lot about this structural and I, in my personal opinion, it doesn't add any cost and it doesn't need a, a state amendment. The next section 704.6.1, uh, secondary attachments to structural members. So this is a new section. Uh, it replaces existing state amendment. So we will repeal the existing state amendment and we will adopt the model code. 
Uh, however, uh, there is a minor difference here. Uh, and the existing state amendment addresses secondary non-structural, and this is in Washington, non-structural tubular attachments to structural members. And the model code doesn't specify that these are the secondary attachments and uh, uh, doesn't clarify, doesn't specify these are non-structural and tubular attachments. So I, I put a question mark on the cost because I, I personally didn't feel it will make any difference, but I, I wasn't sure. So if, if you folks can wait on this, uh, again, my personal opinion, and I didn't find anything in the ICC documents uh, to talk about the cost, uh, so I couldn't justify if there is a cost associated with it. So Stoyan, the existing amendment says any attachments to structural members with fireproofing require this kind of protection that the, the new section requires? No, no, the the existing the existing uh, uh, has the non-structural in 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 print in parentheses and says tubular attachments to structural members, mm -hmm. and the model code how it's written, I guess it will apply to all secondary uh, attachments, not just tubular ones. Not just tubular ones. Okay. This is how I understand it. And so the intent behind this, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't there when they wrote it. This, if it, if it kind of existed in this format, it probably came up through Wabo to this national level. Is that how it got in there? If it was a state well, amendment first. This is this is my first uh, court cycle in Washington, yeah. but uh, uh, to the best of my understanding, uh, uh, many sections uh, were adopted in in the Washington Building Codes because these sections were. Uh, already adopted or under development uh, for mm -hmm. uh, 2021. So now yeah. we are in 2021, but we did adopt these sections uh, earlier. Okay. Uh, I'm not yeah. sure if this is the case for uh, uh, this section. I'm just assuming it is because I didn't find the complete rationale for it, but. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering what the rationale is. I think it, it must be heat conduction through whatever is attaching to your primary structural member trying not to get weakening by whatever's attached to it that's conducting a bunch of heat. That's the only thing I can figure that this is for. So if I put on the cost, if I put no, and uh, we, we go with it for the standing committee meeting and for the council, that this will give us some extra time to uh, dig deeper and figure out uh, how important this uh, non-structural non-structural and tubular clarifications are um, i found the the state proposal i found it's not really a rational it describes what we're doing but it doesn't say anything about why we're doing it okay so i didn't i didn't have enough time to research it If there is a cost, I'm trying to think of what it would be. I, I can't imagine it's very significant. Um, so I'm not too concerned about it personally. Okay, so Krista, can you put no? And uh, I'll, I'll keep it on my to-do list. Okay, uh, it, like if it was, yes, it'd be a lowercase y, like <laughs> not an uppercase one. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, the next one is 705.2.3 uh, projection protection. I find this a, a, a clarification. Um, it, it, it's intended to clarify the language and not to change the technical requirements. So I, I have the cost and uh, a potential amendment uh, with uh, N, no. The next one is uh, uh, section 705.5 and table 705.5. So what happened was uh, uh, all details from table 602 were relocated to, say, uh, to table 
this is related uh, to the fire resistant ra uh, rating. So uh, this section provides a reference to table 705.5 and again uh, uh, table 7070, uh, I'm sorry, table 602 uh, was relocated to section 705 for inclusion with the general exterior wall requirements. And uh, well, the table was also revised and currently it includes the mass timber construction types, but this was uh, discussed several times. I don't, I don't think there is any cost associated with it. We, we already had it adopted in 2018, most of it. It's just the table relocation. Uh, 706.1.1, it's titled party walls, and it, it adds the term party walls to exception two. So currently in exception two, we have only the term firewalls uh, that, that is used. And uh, this is for clarification purposes, to clarify that the walls constructed uh, under exception two are allowed to have penetrations in accordance with the restrictions stated in the exception. And the, there are some editorial modifications. So I have no for the cost and no for uh, uh, local amendment. 706.6.1 is uh, for step buildings. Uh, this is a new model code language, but it aligns with the existing state amendment in this section. So uh, I have no uh, cost for it. 707.4 exterior walls. Again, uh, this is a new model called language, but it's been adopted uh, in 2018 in Washington. And we will repeal the state amendment and we'll adopt the uh, uh, model code. There is a new exception which addresses exterior walls required to be fire resistance rated in accordance with section 1207 of the International Fire Code for enclosure of energy storage systems. Again, because it's related to our existing uh, amendment and I have no uh, for cost and no for uh, uh, state amendment. The next one, 707.5 continuity, it adds exception three and this exception three aligns with the existing state amendment. So uh, no cost associated. The next one, 708.1. This is one section that I struggled with. This is why I have more information. Uh, this section is related to the fire partitions and these are the general requirements. So uh, uh, 708.1 is corrected by completing the listing of locations where fire partitions are already recognized. Uh, so walls separating ambulatory care facilities from adjacent spaces, corridors or tenant as required by section 422.2 and walls separating dwelling and sleeping units in groups R1 and R2 in accordance with sections 907.281 and 907.291. Uh, the last one is vestibules in accordance with section 1028.2. Uh, so in addition, the exception in uh, uh, section 708.4.1 that allows fire partitions to be supported by non-rated floors in types 2B, 3B, and 5B construction is expanded to include fire partitions that create separations in ambulatory care facilities those in groups R1 and R2 that are installed to modify required fire alarm provisions and those creating a vestibule regulated as an interior exit discharge element. Why I have that much uh, as a comment? Because I, I guess the new model code uh, exceeded my knowledge on this topic and uh, I wanted to be sure you, you have enough information if you want to make a comment. So my, uh, in personal opinion, dealing with ICC rulemaking documents and in reading this new amendment, I didn't find any cost associated with it, but I, I'm not sure I'm correct on this one. I think you're right, Stoyan. 
I think they're just capturing other places fire partitions are mentioned, I'm trying to have a more holistic list. Okay. I'm surprised I did it right then. Uh, the next one is uh, uh, 708.4.1 supporting construction and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, connected to the one 708.1 that I already uh, talked about. So uh, will be the same cost? No. Seven oh nine point four point one. This is related to smoke barrier assemblies separating smoke compartments and another section that I wasn't really uh, comfortable with. Uh, it, this section is connected to other sections, including uh, the definition uh, for uh, uh, smoke barrier. So. I don't want to read everything. Uh, I spent hours on this section uh, evaluating and I have cost uh, impact, I have no, but again, I will uh, rely on your experience, the folks that have experience with this uh, uh, smoke barrier uh, assemblies to correct me if, my, if, if I'm wrong. I think you're right. I think it's another um, example of them trying to have better language in yeah, the this, code. I think that's how we've treated it all along. Yeah, I agree. This is how I, I absolutely agree. Good job, Stoyan. I agree. Okay. Moving to the next one. Uh, uh, 710.5.3. This is a, a, a new section and it's related to uh, pass through openings in group I2, uh, condition two. So the new requirements are uh, for pass through openings again in group I2, condition two. And um, the intent is to recognize important operational functions in the context of the corridor wall. So this new section will increase the cost of construction because it allows extra features to be added to an opening. The caveat here is that it doesn't add cost to the healthcare industry because these requirements are already followed in the context of the federal standard. And uh, I got this comment from uh, uh, the person that proposed it on ICC, a national level. And uh, uh, based on my research, uh, I think I agree that there will be no cost on the healthcare industry, but healthcare industry is something that I am not really knowledgeable on. So I'll, if you can yeah. help me with that. I, I, I think this looks good. I think what you're saying here is that these provisions uh, in now in the building code are being correlated with those requirements that are currently applied to these types of fac healthcare facilities uh, via NFPA 101. That's correct. Yes. So, so this makes this is a good change because we don't like to have differences in the federally adopted standards in this case NFPA 101 versus the versus the building code because it gets confusing. So this is great. I think you've done a good job capturing it. Okay, so we have no, I'll keep the nose there. The next one, 712.1.7, it is related to atriums. And um, Damon already talked about uh, the definition for atriums in, in uh, chapter two. So the definition was modified, but also the section was modified to bring some uh, language from the old definition into the code. So there shouldn't be... Uh, uh, any uh, regulatory changes. And this is why I have it with no, uh, no cost and uh, no amendment is needed. 713.12, uh, this is enclosure at top. Um, the section was revised and uh, the revisions uh, are intended to clarify how the top of a shaft is permitted to be terminated. Uh, the format 
uh, aligns uh, with uh, section 713.11 for the bottom of the shaft and identify the common termination conditions and their requirements. So these three termination conditions already exist in the code and the revision, in my opinion, doesn't create uh, any technical change to the uh, code requirements. So cost, no, and amendment needed is no. Uh, the next one is new 713.12.1 penthouse mechanical rooms. Uh, this new section recognizes that not every pen, uh, penetration or opening that pierces a roof requires protection. Uh, where a mechanical penthouse provides an extension of a shaft enclosure from below, it has been clarified that neither a fire nor smoke damper is required at such penetrations, provided all ductwork in the shaft enclosure is directly connected to uh, heating, ventilation, and HVAC equipment. So uh, this is again a clarification and by clarifying how shafts are terminated at the top should reduce cost of construction, confusion and unnecessary installation of dampers. Uh, and uh, I have no, because again, uh, the intent for this uh, new section is to reduce the cost by clarifying the language. Uh, the next one is 715 joints and voids. And uh, this is uh, uh, mm, under a different name, uh, fire resistant joint systems, uh, uh, as it appears in 2018 International Building Code. So the provisions for joints and voids are reformatted and uh, uh, clarified to provide uh, for more consistent application. Uh, most of the revisions are editorial and uh, will not uh, provide new regulatory uh, changes. So I have, I have no for cost. Uh, table 716.1.2 uh, is related to opening fire protection assemblies, rating and uh, markings. Uh, so uh, what it, uh, the opening protection is, addressed again in this uh, uh, in the uh, what the changes are providing the opening protection is addressed where two doors are used to protect a single opening such as between adjacent hotel rooms and it, this is a very common application or uh, where a double firewall is constructed the code change will not increase or decrease the cost of construction uh, because it's intended uh, to clarify the requirements for specific apl application. I have no, and uh, I, got, I got the uh, comment for this section from uh, ICC rulemaking documents. I think it was discussed in detail there. And uh, I, I found a benefit to use it as is. 716.2.2.1, smoke and draft control. Uh, there is a new language in this section which prohibits the use of terminated stops on door flames of door providing smoke and draft control protection at elevator lobbies. Uh, terminated stops are now defined in chapter two. Um, we already discussed chapter two a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the modification addresses what is currently allowed and prohibited in the code, but not explicitly spelled out. So in, in a summary, it's intended to clarify and not to create new requirements. So the cost is a no. Energy storage system separation. There are a few sections that are uh, addressing energy storage uh, uh, system separation. Uh, and I wasn't sure, uh, I couldn't add yes or no related to the cost because I didn't really understand it and I, I will need help on, on, this, uh, on this one. So uh, additional new construction, construction parameters related to enclosures for energy storage systems are now in IBC to supplement, supplement the International Fire Code operational requirements for these systems. To both both 
adequately isolate and protect energy storage systems from potential thermal runaway. The use of glazing with only a fire protection rating is prohibited in fire resistance rated walls that are a portion of the enclosure of energy storage systems. Uh, the new section will increase the cost of construction specific to energy storage systems, but it is negligible compared to the overall cost of compliance when installing energy storage systems. I couldn't, I couldn't, I understood the cost with, uh, you know, uh, providing more requirements for the glass, but, um, I couldn't justify how negligible is compared to the overall cost of compliance when installing energy storage systems. So um, I would put no, but I couldn't, I didn't feel comfortable with it. So I will need some help on that one. This is Al Scully and I, I, I'd agree. And in, in some cases, the, the cost of the fire rated glazing is actually more than, uh, to install that is actually, could be more than than just having a solid wall uh, or a solid door um, as an example. So I think it's negligible at best. I would agree with you. Yeah, and you don't have to have a window, right? So that, yes, that's a that's design right. choice to put a window in. And if you want one, it's gonna be really expensive. But right. You don't have to have one. Okay, we can put no then. Agree. Okay, thank you. 716, 3, 2, 1, 1, 1. Jeez, too many numbers. But this is another section related to uh, uh, energy storage uh, systems. Uh, and uh, based, on, based on your comment, I, I can put no there instead of question mark. Again, these sections are uh, related and, uh, and some of them, the, the language is very close. Uh, the next one, 716.4, fire protective curtain assembly. Uh, labeling and performance requirements for fabric fire protective curtain assemblies have been established. Uh, again, uh, in this new uh, uh, section, the use of the fire protective curtain assembly is an option and a search. Uh, uh, so anyway, I, I, I'll skip the, the details here, but this is an option. So uh, a, a person, a developer, whoever is uh, uh, following this requirement doesn't need to follow everything. This is another option for compliance. This is why I have it with no. Another new section, uh, seven, 17.2.3 uh, static uh, dampers. And uh, this section permits the use of uh, static ceiling radiation dampers where controls are used to shut down the airflow. And uh, this section is coordinated with sections 17.3.1, uh, which is uh, damper testing, 717.6.2.1.1 uh, dynamic systems, and 717.6.2.1.2 static systems, and the definition of uh, a ceiling uh, radiation damper. So there are changes in all these uh, sections and the changes don't increase the cost of construction. Uh, all modifications or relocation of existing installation requirements for ceiling radiation dampers to the appropriate code sections. Uh, so, there was a detailed, uh, I don't really like to use the significant changes that ICC is publishing because sometimes the comments are uh, misleading, but there was a very good and detailed comment for this section and I used a lot of it. So um, uh, my uh, recommendation here for cost and amendment needed is no. Uh, the next one, 717.3.3.1, fire damper uh, actuation and, and um, the, the, chan the change in the title is consistent with the title used for smoke damper actuation. So it, it, this is a clarification. 
uh, editorial modifications, it, it, I don't find any uh, cost associated with it. Uh, 717.4, access and identification. Uh, the section currently exists in 2018. It was amended and, and uh, the modification uh, provides key information in the in IBC regarding access to fire and smoke dampers. So the access is needed for, and, and this is uh, a coordination with the fire code. Uh, the access is needed for periodic testing required by uh, the, the fire code. And the revisions in these sections are uh, basically editorial reform, uh, reformatting of the existing provisions. Uh, section 717.41, 411 and 4.2 are addressing the need for access, the access opening itself and the identification of the access point. And um, there is only one technical change here, uh, the specific size requirement of a minimum 12 inch by 12 inch opening. So again, coordination with the fire code uh, a fire code requires the testing and uh, the size of and how you do the testing is taken care of in the building code during construction. Uh, my recommendation here for the cost is no and uh, uh, no need for a state amendment. The next one, 717.5.2, uh, fire barriers. Uh, this is an allowance to eliminate fire dampers where a fully ducted HVAC system is provided. Uh, the, the language was modified and currently how, it's how it is in 2021 permits the use of flexible connections. Uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't find any costs associated with it. Next one. 717.523, and I will, I will include the subsection, which is new, uh, 531, uh, shaft enclosures, and the subsection is continuous upward airflow. And uh, so what is it about? Uh, where ducts are used to create the continuous upward airflow, penetrations of these ducts into and out of shaft will now be required to be protected with a true penetration fire stop system in lieu of a fire and smoke damper. Um, I, think, I think it decreases the cost and not increase, and I have no for the cost. 717.6.2.1, uh, and 717.6212. These are new sections and I already uh, had a detailed information uh, in 717.23. So these uh, are sections for dynamic systems and the static systems, they are, uh, they are similar, they're connected. 718.2.1, uh, fire blocking uh, materials. Uh, we have existing amendment, uh, the model code is the same. Uh, so no cost associated with it. The next one is editorial. I told you I were killed a, a little bit and I included the editorial too. 727, 722.7 fire resistant rating for mass timber. Uh, this is uh, uh, a new model code language. Uh, uh, I will include the tables and subsections here and this aligns the, uh, with the existing uh, state amendment. So it's a, it's a big section, but uh, we already have it in 2018. And uh, believe me or not, but I'm done with chapter seven. All right, any, any questions or comments? If not, let's, uh, let's entertain a motion. This is Al, I move to accept the recommendations that Stoyan presented. Thanks Al. This is Sue, I'll second. Thank you, Sue. Any further discussion? And all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? And the motion passes. Thank you. Uh, chapter eight was discussed uh, last week, uh, but uh, you didn't vote on it. All right, any questions or discussion? 
If not, let's uh, take a motion. I'll move to adopt the recommendations for chapter eight. Thank you. That was too right. Yes. And, uh, any seconds? Chris, I'll second. Thanks, Chris. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? And motion passes. Uh, chapter nine was approved. Our recommendations were approved. Uh, chapter 10 is the other one that was discussed, but the tag didn't vote on it. All right, so uh, any discussion on chapter 10? If not, anyone want to make a motion? This is Al, a motion to accept the recommendations as previously presented. Thank you, Al. This is Sue, all second. Thank you, Sue. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? And motion passes. Uh, chapter 11 was approved. Chapter 12 was approved. Uh, we don't adopt chapter 13. And uh, chapter 14, uh, exterior walls. Uh, 1402.5, uh, this is related to water resistive uh, uh, barriers. So it's a, the section was retitled and a new reference to section 703.3 is added uh, pertaining to determination of combustibility and exception two is reorganized. So I, I didn't find any regulatory changes. Um, so the cost and uh, potential amendment, I have no. Uh, 1403.2, water resistive barrier, uh, again, reorganization, and uh, there are two more options provided in the new language uh, for water resistive barriers. This is uh, ESTM E2556 for type one or two, ESTM E331 in accordance with section 1402.2. Again, these are two more options, uh, a, a choice, a design choice. So I have, I have no. Section 1403.14, this is a new section. Uh, the title is Attachments Through Insulation. Uh, this section provides a reference to sections 2603.11, 2603.12, or 26.3.13 for, uh, for exterior wall coverings attached to the building structure through foam plastic insul insulating sheeting. Although it's a new section, I didn't find any cost associated with it, but I also didn't find anything uh, in the ICC documents. So consider this a, a, a personal opinion. 1404.3, uh, and I will include all subsections and tables here. Uh, this is related to, to vapor retarders. So the provisions for vapor retarders are reorganized uh, to make them more user-friendly, utilizing new tables and text to assist the designer in selecting uh, appropriate vapor retarders for the cl cl climate conditions and desired vapor retarder class. I uh, spent a lot of time looking at these modifications and I didn't find anything new uh, that will uh, require uh, new expensive technical requirements. So this is why I have it with N uh, on the cost. The next one is table 1404.3.1. Uh, this is a new table uh, related to um, continuous insulation with class two vapor retarder. So this table assigns minimum continuous insulation R values where class two vapor retarders are installed. Uh, the modified section 1404.3 allows the use of a class two interior vapor retarder where foam plastic insulating sheeting is used as continuous insulation of the exterior of buildings. So this is a modified provision and it, the intent is to coordinate requirements for 
vapor retarders with the typical insulation requirements found in uh, the energy code for wood framed wall assemblies and I have no, but I'm not sure if it's no, because we need to coordinate with the energy code uh, with this section. And uh, I was planning to talk to Krista about it, but I, when I completed this section, it was too late and the next day Krista was doing something else. So we didn't discuss it, but we will uh, uh, probably next week. So if somebody has, I'm sure you guys, everybody have more experience than me on the uh, Washington Energy Code, but uh, I'm asking for this N if some of you uh, feels that this need to be changed to yes. I'm guessing not. Okay, I, I, I heard the silence, so I'm moving, I'm moving forward. Uh, 1404.4, this is related to flashing and it provides language to coordinate with similar uh, text in uh, 2018 uh, residential code section R703.4, uh, uh, which appropriately, appropriately recognizes that some flashing applications uh, direct water to the water resistive barrier surface where it's subsequently drained at flushing or whips extending through the exterior wall covering. Sorry, I got this from the uh, significant changes, but it's a coordination between uh, uh, two codes. I didn't find any cost impact. Fourteen oh four point ten point two uh, related to exterior. Masonry veneers, uh, uh, this is uh, for the porcelain tile. So I will skip the details here. Uh, I think uh, I'm comfortable with saying that it doesn't have cost impact. But uh, if you have comments, I'm uh, open to listen. If not, I will continue to the Next one, 1404.14. It allows the use of vinyl siding on exterior walls where the design wind pressure is up to 30 pounds per square feet. Uh, requires tests or calculations indicating compliance with chapter 16 if the design wind pressure is above 30 pounds per square feet. So uh, currently what we have in the building code uh, in 2018 building code the uh, use of this type of siding is based on allowable stress design wind speed uh, and a building height. So it, it changes the approach. Um, and I think, I think as a personal opinion, it doesn't create more restrictive requirements, but I'm not really a structural engineer and I, I couldn't uh, really justify that. So if uh, you folks uh, can help me on that. I have it as no, but uh, wasn't really sure it's the right uh, answer. No comments? Okay. The next one is uh, 1404. 1411, 1412, and 1413. Uh, this is a new section uh, related to fasteners and fastener penetration for wood construction, cold formed steel, light frame construction, and fastener spacing. Uh, I will include uh, our sections there. So 1404, 1411, in summary, addresses vinyl siding fasteners and fastener penetration for wood construction, uh, directly references the new term nylable, if I'm saying this right. I've never used it before. Nylable substrate. Uh, the next section 1404, 1413 uh, specifies that fasteners shall be installed in the middle third of the slots of the nail 
so I didn't, based on existing requirements, comparing the existing requirements with the new requirements, I didn't find any cost impact. Uh, but um, if you can add some, if some of you is more knowledgeable than me, I'll consider this not as a personal opinion. I couldn't uh, uh, justify this by uh, documents or the ICC uh, comments on the ICC site. So. Okay. The next one is uh, 140610, uh, 140610 one and 140610 two uh, related to uh, metal composite materials, MCM, uh, for types one, two, three, and four uh, construction. So the requirements for MCM installed on exterior walls of buildings of type one, two, three, and four construction are uh, uh, simplified and limited by the deletion of the uh, alternate conditions previously set uh, in section 14.06.11. Uh, in other than type five construction, the installation of MCM panels and MCM systems are now regulated based on one of the uh, two thresholds. MCMs installed no more than 40 feet above great plane and MCMs installed more than 40 feet above great plane. So, Currently in 2018, you'll, you'll see a few pages uh, uh, related to these uh, uh, products because uh, the current language provides uh, alternative options and the new language uh, don't really have the alternative provisions. It sets the requirements again, based on uh, one of two thresholds. So as a, Personal opinion evaluation, I have no, uh, but uh, I don't, I'm not sure it's the right answer. Uh, the next one, 14.06.12 is only editorial modifications. So I'm not going to spend uh, much time on it. 14.08.10.3, uh, high pressure decorative exterior grade compact uh, laminates um, and uh, this is in a case where a thermal barrier is not uh, uh, required so this is a, a, a revision regarding the reference to testing in accordance with ul 1040 and ul 1715 uh, the references are retained but the option is added to use nfpa 286 with uh, again uh, with our corresponding criteria uh, and uh, NFPA is developed uh, way after uh, UL 1040 and UL 715 uh, based on what I found out. And uh, it was not included in every section of the, of the code. So uh, since now NFPA 286 is used much more widely than you know, UL 1040 and UL 715, uh, um, it's included in the model code. I didn't find any cost associated with it because again, first it's an option and second, it's a, a widely used uh, standard. The last one, <clears throat> the last one in chapter 14, uh, 1408, 11, one, this is for high pressure uh, decorative exterior grade compact laminates. Um, and uh, it's specific to installations up to 40 feet in height. Uh, so the exception for these systems up to 50 feet currently in 2018, uh, and this exception allows uh, uh, this application uh, not to be tested to NFPA uh, 285. So the exception is eliminated. The, the 2021 language doesn't have it. Uh, the elimination of the current allowance uh, allowing the use of uh, uh, high pressure decorative exterior grade compact laminates to up to 50 feet on almost all buildings will lead to a more expensive fire testing product 
are being required for uh, these products. Uh, about 40 feet as fire testing to NFPA 285 will be required. So again, in summary, currently, if it's up to 50 feet, there is an exception that exempts the uh, uh, use of the testing based on NFPA 285. And the new language sets it, set the requirement up to 40 feet. So everything about 40 feet will be required to be tested uh, um, to NFPA 285. And I think there is a cost, uh, there is a cost impact with it. Uh, this is all I have for chapter 14. All right, perfect. Any questions or comments? How about a motion? This is, this is Sue. I, I move to adopt uh, the recommendations for Chapter 14. Thank I'll you, second. Sue, and Chris. Thank you, Chris. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? And motion passes. Uh, it's 12 o'clock, I understand you may be tired listening to me, uh, but if, if, Andrew, if, if uh, somebody wants to take a break or I can continue talking. Yeah, I think we're almost done, so let's just power through. Okay. Unless you need so, a break. No, uh, <clears throat> well, if I, if I lose my, my voice, I will ask for it. <laughs> okay. I'm okay for now. Uh, 26 was discussed last week, so all we need is a vote. All right. Any questions or discussion? I think we should probably put something in. Uh, I might need a uncertain. second to read through 20. Can I get a minute to read real quick? Sure. Chris, what was your comment? Oh, I think we should probably uh, replace the uncertain with a, a something. Um, I would suggest that we put a lowercase y <laughs> and say <laughs> um, a, a note in there kind of talking about what Corey mentioned last week about um, large manufacturers may have to provide more expensive light panels in tall manufacturing facilities. So I don't think a huge cost impact, but the people that it does impact um, aren't afraid to rattle cages. So that's probably why it's a good idea to give them a heads up. And, I would say. Okay. Just a friendly uh, suggestion. Just just say manufacturers, not to single anybody out. Ah, uh, okay. Good point. <laughs> should, yeah, I would probably prefer to go um, Boeing, but yeah, it's probably. <laughs> well, but we don't know, right? That's true. Anybody who wants to do stuff in big warehouses that are tall, that could impact. Would would you? This is so. Would you say like manufacturing occupancies? I, I don't know if I would go there because I'm even thinking about like uh, uh, there are quite tall uh, manufacturers that do things like manufacture plywood. Um, there, there's all kinds of manufacturing out there. It's really associated with manufacturers that, that have big buildings. It's really about big, big, tall buildings, right? Yeah, it's really about big, tall buildings, specifically big, tall buildings that are 75 feet tall. So it's not a typical building or structure. So it kind of along the lines of that one that Stoyan had earlier about is the cost gonna be that significant considering what you're actually building? Maybe not, but it is a cost for sure. All right, any other comments, Damon? Did you have a chance to finish? 
reading? Yeah, I had, yeah, thank you. I'm fine. Okay. Thank you for the brief pause. Yep. Any additional comments or questions? If not, we'll entertain a motion. This is Al, a motion to accept the recommendations as previously presented. Thank you, Al. Do we have a second? This is Sue, all second. Thank you, Sue. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? And motion passes. Uh, I'm moving to chapter uh, 27, the electrical requirements. Uh, 27, section 2702.1.2 is uh, fuel line piping protection. So what it does is um, adds another option for protecting fuel lines, supplying a generator set inside a high rise building through the use of uh, fire resistant pipe protection system tested to UL. 1489. Uh, fuel lines supplying uh, station, stationary generators already require uh, protection uh, in accordance with this section. So my recommendation for the cost is uh, no, and uh, it doesn't need a state amendment. The next section, uh, 2702.2.3, emergency responder communication coverage systems. And I intentionally just uh, copied, uh, uh, did copy paste uh, uh, from the code. I was having a hard time to uh, figure out what was happening with this section on the ICC site because originally it was disapproved and then approved and disapproved again and, and it showed up in the code. So I guess I didn't find all documents I needed or something was going on and I didn't find any rational uh, uh, so again, I was having a hard time to evaluate it and, uh, you know, the folks with more experience in this, uh, 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 fire and safety related systems, uh, I would need a little help on this one. I have a suspicion. Um, let me just verify it real quick. I think it's a language thing that they were fighting over that really doesn't matter. Hi, this is Ken in Seattle. Yeah, that's what it was. It was just some terminology issues. And this all came from Section 510 of the IFC. And it was just duplicated over into the, the section. It, it appears as modified and then the original, the existing language and then modified again. So I couldn't, I couldn't track uh, what was going on. So I guess if this is, if this is uh, uh, terminology only, uh, I would put no for the cost. Yeah, that's what I'm doing yeah. on the fire code side is it's it's not a, a cost impact. Yeah, okay. it, it it's it used to say radio communication. And so it it's just is covering all, including like the wired two way systems, I think is kind of the the root of it. Does that sound right, Ken? Yeah, it does. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think so. It, it was little details for people that really cared about it, but it's not a big deal. Okay, uh, next one is uh, 20, uh, 2702.2.4 emergency voice alarm communication systems. So, with this section, uh, depending on the interpretation, uh, uh, this could reduce the cost of uh, construction. So, uh, Overall, this will provide, again, the, the, the modified section uh, will provide code clarity and alignment with NFPA 72 and within uh, IBC and, uh, uh, and the fire code. So I have the uh, cost impact no uh, for this section. All right, great. Any questions or comments? Uh, Ken, what do you know about that one? It says standby power instead of emergency power now. Yeah, I'll have to jump into that one. Okay. Um, that's that's weird to me that it would say standby and not emergency. Are you talking oh, you're, you're talking about the one above, the 2702.2.3? No, dot four. Dot four. 
yeah it the 21 language says standby power shall be provided in accordance with nfpa 72 was that a i don't know enough about that one that might be um, yeah I think that actually reduces the cost because standby power requirements yeah. are less than emergency power requirements. Right. I mean, to the point where I would probably say we need a state amendment if that was the case. To, I don't. I don't think I would support standby power on fire alarm systems. Well, this might be one that I need to note to make an amendment to. All right, good discussion. Anything else? If not, would anyone like to make a motion? This is Chris, I'll, I'll move to move forward the recommendations as shown on the screen. All right, thank you, Chris. This is Al, second. Thank you, Al. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, and motion passes. Uh, <clears throat> I'm moving to 28, and it was easy one because there are no changes. Um, uh, 29, uh, there are not very many changes, but they will require our attention. So 2902, and it's, it's a long section and it includes uh, several subsections. It's related to uh, minimum uh, plumbing facilities. So what it, the rationale for the change is uh, multiple clarifications and modifications have been made to the regulation of plumbing facilities to address significant issues of gender and equality of access. There are several existing state amendments in this section. This is, so the first sentence was the rational I got from ICC and everything else is my comment. So uh, there are several existing state amendments in this section. And uh, I would suggest, uh, recommend we, we do some additional evaluation and side-by-side -side comparison uh, to determine how the new model code language affects the existing amendments. I just didn't have enough time to do that. It, it needs uh, some uh, extra hours uh, to do that. And I didn't have time at that time when I was working on this chapter, but I, I will do it. I will do it later. Uh, so I have uncertain here because I didn't, again, I didn't have side-by-side -side comparison and I'm sure it will need uh, amendments because uh, uh, we need to blend our existing uh, uh, state uh, amendments into the new model code language. So for the cost, uh, I, I didn't want to guess, uh, but I didn't want to guess, but uh, for, for the uh, state amendment, I'm sure there will be a need for state amendment. So, so this is Mark. I just had a question. I, I thought we already went over plumbing systems with the amendments. Um, didn't they do that? Didn't Sevy and Bellingham do that? The, these, two, these two are all connected. Uh, give me a second. I'll get to 90, uh, 2902. Uh, 29. So, Kim uh, did a great job on nine, uh, but there are uh, several sections that are uh, evaluation and, and traditional research. And uh, when I was uh, <clears throat> evaluating the significant changes, I took into account what what she had for the existing amendments. So. Uh, just chapter 29 in general and section 2902 in specific, uh, we will need more work on that. 
Uh, so are we just commenting on, on uh, the uh, significant changes portion of it? I'm sorry, I, can, I couldn't hear you. Are we just talking about the significant changes on 29? Yes. Currently, we are under significant changes, but they are somehow uh, uh, connected to the existing amendment. So we have new model code language that uh, needs to be amended and we need to evaluate. So now is the connection to the existing amendments. We need to evaluate our existing amendments based on the new model code language. So if my best estimate, I would say there is no cost associated with this section, but because again, I didn't have enough time to do a, a detailed comparison. This is why I put uncertain. If, if you wish, we can change it to uh, no, but uh, this chapter will need uh, uh, extra work. Yeah. And it's not... just a... Go ahead, who was that? Well, I was gonna say, I, I mean, the, the task now is to say if uh, uh, there is, the task now is to flag chapters and sections that will need extra work. And this is one of those. Yeah, I would say no for now, and then write in the re recommendation that it needs to be um, amended with our state amendments. Correlated, that's good work. Uh, the next one is uh, 2903, uh, installation of... Uh, 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 fixtures. So this section brings the requirements for installation of plumbing fixtures from the International Plumbing Code. And I, I have wrong, I, I, I'm wrongly showing 2903 in 2018. I think uh, 2903 is a new section. And uh, so it brings uh, 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 new requ uh, requirements from uh, that are currently in, in the International Plumbing Code. And uh, uh, in, in Washington, we adopt the uniform plumbing code. So I don't see a cost associated with it, but we need to amend uh, uh, this section if we decide to adopt it, or we just, uh, it will be the council decision, but the other option is just not, not adopted. So two options, not adopt these sections or bring uh, uh, requirements from the uniform plumbing code. Again, no cost associated with it because these requirements are already exist somewhere. Uh, in, in our case, in the Uniform Plumbing Code. Uh, this is all I have for 29. All right. Any additional comments or questions on 29? Uh, this is Chris. I would suggest that when we tell State Plumbing Code Council um, we might not want to, we might to not want to suggest that they not adopt the section because that may be more confusing about an intent. We probably want to modify it because if we say we don't adopt the section, that may cause people to think that even though it's in the UPC, we don't have to enforce it. I'm not sure what 2903 says, but by saying not adopt it, that would maybe be more confusing than amending it. So to match. correlate with UPC maybe. Yeah. If we correlate with UPC, well, it, it, the, the decision is, do we need to duplicate the requirements from UPC uh, in, uh, in the international code? So the, the, the best case scenario is everybody now sell codes, which in real life, it doesn't happen. And uh, the intent for this uh, model code modification was uh, to have the uh, plumbing requirements up front uh, for, uh, uh, architects and designers or when they design the building. Yeah, uh, I like it. I'd hate for someone to see the uh, state amendment showing it crossed out, um, you know, thinking that it's not applicable um, and then it is in the UPC. So I'd agree with what Chris said. I think I'm saying what you're saying, correct, Chris? Yep, exactly. That's just, okay. I, they, they're not sitting, nobody else is sitting here and then they look at that and go, Oh, I don't have to do that.
but with that, are you looking for a motion, Andrew? Yep. You want to make a motion, Chris? Sure. Uh, I move to uh, move forward the recommendations on Chapter 29. Thank you. Do we have a second? Sal, I'll second. All right. Thanks, Sal, for your reluctant second. Um, uh, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? And motion passes. Uh, okay, I'm moving to chapter 30, 30, elevators and conveying systems. The first section is uh, 3001.2, emergency elevator communication systems for the deaf, hard of hearing and speech impaired. So uh, I would consider this new, uh, well, the section is not new, but modified language as uh, additional direction and uh, clarity uh, regarding the appropriate emergency two-way communication features that are mandated for accessible elevators. So the mandate is in uh, chapter 11 and, and ANSI A117. Uh, these are more specific uh, provisions on the installation uh, site. So it may increase the cost of construction. Uh, and I got an average of uh, $250 for uh, keyboard components and uh, some visual indicators, but Again, it's an average. It's not that expensive, but it's an additional cost. Uh, so I, I didn't put yes, no, I put minimal because uh, you know we're talking about bigger projects here. So it's not related to single family dwellings. Uh, and uh, I know money is important, but uh, we have uh, cost versus uh, uh, civil rights uh, accessibility. So I, I, I put minimal but if you recommend yes or no either one we can we can change it and uh, the next section 3005.4 is editorial so uh, 3001 is the important one and this is all for chapter 30. we need right. to Thank reach you. out to l and i on that requirement or does that line up with what the asme elevator standards are or do we know i don't know <laughs> I, I couldn't hear the question oh sorry my mic got moved away from my, my face um do we need to coordinate with l and i on that requirement to make sure that their requirements and standards match ours when this comes uh, around because we I don't, don't really inspect elevators honestly i mean functionally as a city L and I blesses it and we say, thank you. It's not really, well, you may be right. When I was evaluating, it's really for the elevator, something that is outside the elevator, but, uh, and it's in the building code, not, uh, yeah. Oh, is, is this the device within the elevator or the device in the lobby that we're talking about? I thought it was in the lobby. Oh, but okay. I, I'm, I, may, I'm, I may be wrong. Okay. If it's the one in the lobby, then yeah, totally. We look at it. I was thinking it was something inside the elevator. But if this is the, the, the not uh, area of refuge communication system. You know, I, I, I knew the sections that I wasn't familiar with and I spent a lot of time working on these sections. And this is one of those that I felt, ah, okay, it's easy peasy, I know it, but I guess, I guess uh, if I can't answer your question right now, I didn't spend enough time on it. Or I didn't but, ask the question the right way. <laughs> well, question was, was great, I just... <laughs> <laughs> That looks well, to me here like we're that's in the about, uh, We're talking about uh, uh, a component. It's not really mm -hmm. a complete device. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a component. It, it's a keyboard or you know the, the, the indicators. It's not yeah. really part of the elevator. This uh, is inside of it, though. The, inside, okay. Yeah, 
it's definitely inside of the elevator. So um, I would think that we'd want to coordinate with L and I for sure. Okay. But I would assume that the ASME standard has been updated to reflect a similar requirement. I guess I need to double check that for tomorrow's meeting. Yeah, but either way, I mean, I think it's in the code. It makes sense from an accessibility standpoint. It should be fine. And it is not a significant cost if it's only $250 on an elevator. It, um, it's, like, it's, it's not really very different than what's in 2018 either. It looks like just some verbiage uh, differences, but the base requirement seems to be there in 2018. It was intended, based on the rationale, it was intended to provide more specific requirements. Uh, and the, the cost impact was provided with uh, different examples. You know, the cost of different uh, uh, keyboards and, uh, you know, the indicators. All right. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. Um, you know, and if I remember correctly, this would be um, in situations where you don't have a um, an area refuge, correct? So you have the uh, the communication at the elevator. No, this is the thing inside the elevator. Oh, it is inside. Okay. Yeah, the way I'm reading it, it says an emergency two way communication system shall be provided. Uh, and it's when operating in each mode, include a live interactive system that allows back and forth conversation between the elevator occupants and emergency personnel. And then there's okay. a couple more things. So it's the thing inside. Oh, inside. okay. I, I, I thought it was for the, the uh, uh, elevator lobby, uh, but I guess I didn't spend enough time on it. And how you read it, I agree with you. It's, it's for the elevator, inside the elevator. Okay. So, any other comments? If not, Chris, you want to make a motion? Sure, why not? Uh, I move <laughs> to <laughs> move forward these recommendations. All right. Um, Al, you want to make? Oh, thank you, Sue. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed. And motion passes. Uh, the next one is chapter 31, spatial con construction and, and it, the recommendations were approved. Uh, and uh, chapter 32 was easy, uh, there, there are no changes. Uh, chapter 33, safeguards during construction. Uh, we have one new section, 3301.2.1, uh, structural and uh, construction loads. And uh, I have no for the cost, but I intentionally copied the section here. Uh, you, you, you have it on the screen. Uh, so I, I thought this requirement already exists, but I didn't find the ICC rationale for uh, adopting this section. So I wasn't, I wasn't really sure what the intent was. Uh, structural roof components shall be capable of supporting the roof covering system and the material and equipment loads that will be encountered during installation of the system. Uh, I guess it doesn't hurt to have that, but yeah, I would agree with you. There's no, um, no effective change. So, okay. Any uh, any questions or comments on Chapter Thirty Three? And Stoyan, did we vote on Thirty One last time, or do we uh, take, on Thirty One? On Thirty One, we did. Yes, Thirty One, we did. Okay, so we're voting just on Thirty Three now. Thirty Three. Okay. Um, is your uh, motion? No, or, no, no. There, there, there are two more sections. 
Oh, okay. I thought you said that was the only new one. No, okay, no, I said, I said it's a new. I, I misspoke, I guess. Sorry. Uh, the next one is 3307.2, uh, and this is another uh, a new section, uh, excavation retention systems. Uh, this is a new requirement, uh, and it will mandate design by a registered design professional. So uh, anything that uh, requires a registered design professional, I guess, is uh, uh, connected to a, a, a cost. At least this is the impression, so I put yes. Uh, I'm not sure how it's currently uh, uh, maintained on the job sites, but uh, uh, reading the, the, the letter of the law, this is a new section that brings uh, a new cost with it. This is my clarification more than anything else. I think in practice, that was uh, pretty much required anyway. When you're yeah, when you're doing the you know the engineering required to protect an adjacent property, it was very specific, and I uh, um, I, I agree with you that it it should be something enforced on the side, but I couldn't find a direct connection to the existing language. So, uh, we can change yes to no, of course. I guess it could be yes, and then in the explanation column, jurisdictions already not enforcing this would now have a clear place to enforce this. I think most jurisdictions would require that outright if you presented them with a project that's kind of outlined like that. I know in yeah, Tacoma, I think chapter required all time. 19 would have would have kind of dictated that anyway, uh, in, maybe in a roundabout way, which is why this is really a clarification. Yeah. Uh, the, the next one, uh, 33, 13, uh, it's an existing section, but the, it's modified uh, related to water supply for fire protection. And it's a big uh, question mark for me regarding the cost. Uh, what this section does, um, uh, the scoping provisions addressing the timing and availability of the required water supply for buildings under construction uh, have been expanded and specific uh, fire flow requirements have now been established. This is the exact rationale that was used uh, uh, when ICC was uh, going through the process of adopting this section, and I wasn't, I wasn't sure again how it is enforced currently. Uh, so I will rely on folks with more experience in this uh, water supply uh, for fire protect protection. I couldn't put yes or no because again, wasn't sure how it's currently enforced. I think. Well, like in Renton for for us, I mean, we have a local provision for that. So, you know, but some some places don't. But I think it's a good thing to provide for sure. Um, makes sense, you know. A lot of a lot of fires happen during construction. So. Yeah, and it it's it the amendment itself still includes the. If the fire code official wants to lessen the requirements, it's okay if they do. So I think it still leaves flexibility, even though it's a whole new thing. It, it just provides more specific provisions. Uh, in 2018, it's just a sentence or two, and, and this one is much more specific. Yeah, so it probably increases costs some places and decreases it in places where somebody might have more strict requirements already. <laughs> you know, if they. We had something else. So on a statewide application, would it be uh, safe to say no? Because the council doesn't really control that? Yeah, I, I would say, say it's, yes. Yeah. Because it's a new, it's a new uh, requirement there. You always had to have an approved water supply, though. 
So you always were required to have some water available. This is just saying how much. And I think it's reducing maybe a patchwork of different local stuff that may be not codified, but is the way they enforce it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense, but yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to answer Stogan's question. Yes, sir. I guess right. if, yeah. if we're wobbling <laughs> back and forth, it probably doesn't matter. You know, you could justify either way. So yeah. why don't or we I guess... put no since it's not a big deal? Yeah. Um, you know. Any other discussion, questions? This is Mike, just back to the other one where Krista made the note, I would include chapter 18 also, because that's the soils. So it's chapters 18 and 19. Good point, thank you, Mike. Anything else? All right, can we get a motion? Ms. Chris, I'll move to put forward the recommendations on Chapter 33. Thank you, Chris. It's Mike, I'll second. Thank you, Mike. Any further discussion? And all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And all those opposed? And motion carries. So, Stoyan, that is the last on our agenda, is that correct? Yes, this is the amendment. last one. Uh, uh, chapter 35 has changes, but I didn't feel we need to evaluate these changes because these are, uh, you know, uh, the reference standards. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we have appendices with many changes, but these appendices, they are not adopted by the council on a statewide application, they're open for the local enforcing agencies to adopt. Yeah, uh, so there's no reason for us to amend those. So yeah, so I didn't, didn't evaluate those and 33 is the last one I have. All right, so these will be moved forward to tomorrow's meeting. Um, if you're looking into anything, if you change what you, uh, you know, if you disagree with recommendations here and want a second opportunity to speak, That'll be tomorrow at the BFP meeting. Um, and then we'll be discussing these at Friday's meeting with full council. In the BFP meeting will be tomorrow afternoon because in the morning we have the, the energy. Yep. So, all right, Stoyan, did you have anything else? Uh, Yes, I have coffee, but for later. For now, I'm great. No more. <laughs> All right. Anything else for the good of the order by anybody? Um, I think I have some new business. Sure. Go um, ahead. To, yeah. Can I move to amend something previously adopted? Or I'd like to move to amend something previously adopted. Um, well, I guess. I don't see why not. What, uh, you know, just what's, what is it? Um, just, I think that I'd like to amend uh, section 310.4.2. And um, I mean, I went back and looked at it, and I think it's a pretty egregious change from 18 to 21. And I, I think that the amendment should strike out um, the new language that an automatic sprinkler system is installed in accordance with section 903.1.3, just because on 20. 18 code um i at least i think there's a fiscal thing there because it says owner occupied lodging houses with five or fewer guest rooms and 10 or fewer total occupants shall be permitted to be constructed in accordance with the international residential code and i think that that's fine i don't think we need this added language in there well i think what it is here remember in the national model code sprinklers are mandatory in the residential code so the the i it, it i'm ex, i'm not putting value judgment i'm explaining it um so in yeah. the national model code 
uh, sprinklers are assumed. So the idea is that these um, occupancies will be protected by a 13D system. Um, whereas in Washington state, we amended that out. So, you know, I just want to put that out there for discussion. Um, personally, I, I think it's a, a reasonable amendment, but um, yeah, I, I, I'll open it up for discussion and we can see if anyone wants to amend it. Okay. Well, I, I'll tell you what, if you want to make the motion, we'll see if we get a second. <laughs> so uh, I move to amend section 310.4.2 and for the amendment to include striking out um, the automatic sprinkler system is installed in accordance with section 903. Or just to amend it to the 2018 language and to maintain okay. that language. All right. Uh, do we have a second by anyone? Going once, going twice. All right, so that dies for lack of second, Damon. But, um, you know, tomorrow no and Friday, you know, feel free to bring that up. Um, All right. Yeah, I think okay. it's, worth, it's, it's worth noting that, that removing that language would create a conflict between the building code and the residential code. So that's why I think it's important that it remain the way that the 20 Okay has proposed it. Okay. Um, anything else? Any, any other new business? All righty. Well, thanks again for all your work. Um, I'll see some of you tomorrow at the BFP meeting. And when, if anything when is the next up, meeting? Um, I don't know if we have one scheduled for our next tag meeting. Do we, Stogian? Uh, I don't think so. Well, let me check. Give me a second. Okay. I don't know what uh, what work we would have immediately unless something gets sent back to the tag. It, it, it may. So maybe we should get something on the schedule, um, you know, due to public notifications, um, and we can always cancel it if necessary. We, we uh, well... I don't know which term I can use, but uh, for some reason we scheduled five meetings for one week this week, and uh, we are really overwhelmed, and we didn't think about next week. Uh, so let's okay. let's pass the council meeting on Friday, and 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 based on the results of the uh, standing committees tomorrow and the council meeting, I will. Uh, Send everybody an email if we have something new to discuss for for Wednesday, next Wednesday. Yeah, sounds fair to me. Is that okay with everyone? That's great. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else? All right. Well, again, thank you, and yeah, we'll uh, be in touch tomorrow, and uh, Stoyan will be in touch with uh, scheduling the next meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for Thank your help. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.